You know, with Daredevil getting another TV series featuring Jessica Jones and probably some of the other Defenders era characters coming back, I can't help but wonder, when's punishment time? John Bernthal's portrayal of the character was a fan favorite and one of the most enjoyable things to come out of that little branch of the MCU. Maybe I went on record as saying I didn't totally love the writing in his solo show, but Bernthal was perfect and I can't wait for him to return to the character. But until then, we're feeling a big Punisher content drought. What kind of place is this? I'm a thirsty man at death's door, desperate for just a few drops of skull vest wearing revenge. Really, the only thing I have to comfort me in this trying time is to revisit the older Punisher live action outings. Seeing as how I felt the Netflix show left something to be desired outside of its stellar casting, I want to go digging through these and see if any of the three of them gave me the kind of Punisher adaptation I was looking for. One of these is bound to get something right, especially since they're such wildly different films and made in such different ages for comic book movies. Join me as we tear into three generations of Frank Castle cinema and figure out which one best suits the tastes of myself, a very particular fan of the character. What was the best Punisher movie? The 80s wasn't exactly the highlight of Marvel's cinematic saga, with such lovely entries as the original Punisher, Red Sonja, and... Howard the Duck! That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! It's funny to me how the second theatrically released mainstream Marvel movie adaptation had to be that, and the third was this. You couldn't get any more polar opposite if you tried. This was around the time of Donner's Superman trilogy and Burton's Batman movies, and you'd think bigger characters like Spider-Man or Captain America would get some kind of big-budget Hollywood treatment. Sure, there were plans, but nothing finalized in this decade. I guess the Punisher just fit the world of the 80s more. It's a dark, cynical, violent story with no clear hero and lots of guns. The elevator pitch was probably like, imagine Death Wish meets The Godfather, and it got the stamp of approval before they even knew it was from those silly comic rags for dumb babies that would never be profitable in theaters. Dolph Lundgren may not have been my first choice to play Frank Castle, but once you see him in the role, it's like, damn, that guy really looks like Frank Castle, at least circa the 1980s. It's like he leapt right off the page to stab you. What's fascinating about this movie to me is that considering the time period, the budget, the stigma around comic book characters, and how easy this particular character is to screw up, this one's a really solid first try at adapting the Punisher. It's got plenty of flaws, primarily a very start and stop pacing in some scenes that tend to lose my interest, but the actual Punisher-ness of it all has been well established. The movie lights up when he's around. The way he fights has a lot of variety and creativity, and sometimes his wacky schemes to catch the bad guys end up being really convoluted and excessive. But that's the charm! He's like a competent and successful wily e. Coyote in a world full of roadrunners. This movie's got the right amount of cheesiness that I feel like he should be wearing the skull vest and the white boots and gloves. In this script, that wouldn't have been out of place at all. This is already in the realm of violent and campy. It's baffling to me that they'd stop so short of fully committing by omitting the costume. It even has some wacky comic relief side characters like Shake, a guy who hangs out with Frank Castle in the sewers and only speaks in rhymes. Hey, they will, and all for naught. The children will be sold by the slave trade. They'll be bought. My God, man, don't you see? This is a result of your five-year killing spree. Why do we draw the line at the logo on his shirt? Instead, the skull is just on the tip of Punisher's knives, which isn't nearly as cool. Punisher 1989, however, avoided the rookie mistake of spending too much time focusing on the particular criminals that killed the Castle family as the main villains. Instead, that guy gets got in the first five minutes of the movie. I actually prefer how impersonal Punisher's anti-crime wave is. He doesn't want revenge on anyone in particular, just like whoever he thinks has it coming. He's like an 80s slasher villain in that way. Jason Voorhees isn't hunting the teenage camp counselors that let him drown as a child. He's just mad at anyone who even vaguely reminds him of them. The main focus of the movie is taking on New York's biggest gang in addition to a branch of the Yakuza that has decided to start a turf war with them. So the Punisher's just caught in the middle of both groups. 
I think the Yakuza leader, Lady Tanaka, is a really cool villain and a nice change of pace from the usual wise guys in business suits that Frank has to battle. I just wish he had more direct confrontations with her because she's more of an antagonist for the other crime boss, Gianni Franco. That's a Punisher villain name if I've ever heard one. His name could just be Crimebo Italiani. Frank Castle is portrayed as being like, kinda weird and smelly and insane. He lives in the sewers, he's got permanent 5 o'clock shadow, people who used to know him and trust him are now ashamed of what he's become. Lundgren's take on Castle is a guy just waiting to finally get capped in battle. He's so reckless in every mission is a suicide mission for him, but he's just too damn good and keeps making it out alive. His old partner confronts him when he's briefly taken into custody and he just shuts him out like he's dead set on going out there and getting himself killed. Then you're going to electrocute you, and there's nothing I can do anything about but you gotta talk to me, man. Let me in! Let me in! Later in the movie, he even goes out of his way to reject wearing body armor, something the Punisher doesn't normally do. Here, just in case. Have it your way. This take on Frank is just eager to lose, but he never does. That's kind of a cool spin on it. It would have been really easy for the movie to forget he was originally introduced as a villain in the comics and just go, America, hell yeah, kill them all, Frank, you're the best. Painting him as totally justified loses the moral grayness of the character and starts to get to, like, mob mentality anarchy. Society has completely broken down if the Punisher is a role model. And this movie thankfully kept that in mind without also being too preachy about it. The movie doesn't really pick his side at all, he's fully aware that he's doing something wrong. When the lead crime boss's son, Tommy, pulls a gun on Frank, he lets the scene play out. Either willing to be killed by someone he considers innocent and finally get his sweet release, or seeing that little Tommy here doesn't have that same ruthlessness and revenge in his heart. When Tommy can't kill him, Frank is like, yeah, you're a good person, so you didn't give in to revenge. You're a good boy, Tommy grow up to be a good man, because if not, I'll be waiting. This is a subtle but clever admittance that he doesn't really think of himself as a good person. It's just a great scene all around and perfectly caps off the whole story. This is an example of one of my five rules for writing good Punisher stories. Frank Castle is not a morally upright hero guy. Sure, the people he kills are generally pretty terrible and the world probably is better off without them, but the story can't endorse what he does because for all intents and purposes, he is a highly prolific serial killer. His choice of victim just happens to be skilled criminals and other killers, rather than like, women who look vaguely like his mom or something. But scenes like that last one show that he's not a completely heartless and evil person. A good Punisher story can help us understand his motivations, but also make sure that we know he's deeply flawed. He's the tiniest bit noble in the right moment but his personal mission is also very selfish and self-destructive. And to an extent, he's a pretty sick man. Like, he doesn't need to go around tying dudes' intestines to trees or giving his girlfriend Electra a bronzed human heart that he cut out of a crime boss. That stuff's wacky and over the top and too far. Chill out, Frank. This writing the line of being a twisted maniac and kind of a hero, sort of, but not really, is what makes the character so divisive but it's also what makes him interesting and complex, to me at least. I think anyone who says the Punisher is a flat character just doesn't know what they're talking about. However, a lot of these tend to avoid delving too deep into Frank's character and spend most of their time piddling around with various crime bosses and their interpersonal drama as the punishment approaches like that moon in the Zelda game. Coming to crush all their meaningless quibbles like a colony of ants under a boot. This brings us to... Oh, the f***ing goddamn heater, I'm gonna lose my... The first Punisher film in a post-Garth Ennis world. Even back then they were having to rein in his childish ideas and blind superhero hatred. Like Bumpo's body fat being used to smother the Russian to death or half the storyline being about making Wolverine and Daredevil look incompetent and pathetic. The Punisher film from 2004 decided to go back to the origin story and dip its toes a little bit further into comic booky territory with some actual moments adapted straight from the books. Some characters from the Marvel Knights comic even appear, and then even finally, partially embracing the aesthetic of Punisher's signature look. Unfortunately, this particular variant of his logo has been ruined by crazy fake fans over the years who don't know anything about the character, other than, uh, 
Yeah, big dude with a gun! Woo! It's okay, though. It's been drawn like a billion different ways that look much cooler, so you can just look for merch of those if you don't want people side-eyeing you in public as badly. They'll still do it, of course, but maybe less? It was a gift from his son! That's weird and doesn't make sense. I mean, maybe if he was like a metalhead marine that went to Slipknot and Guar concerts like my dad, it'd make sense. But I just can't imagine Frank Castle ever, like, casually wearing this shirt to the grocery store. It was basically just a dark omen that little, uh, uh not Frank Jr. here, was going to get watermelon by a pickup truck. Maybe this shirt is cursed and he should have just burned it to save his family. Splatter spree. Anyway, in this universe, Frank Castle is an undercover FBI agent that runs sting operations against the mob. One day, a routine mission results in the death of the son of notorious maniac John Travolta, I, I, I mean Howard Saint, with vengeance being a particularly big theme of this story, if you've noticed. The Saint crime family retaliate against Agent Castle by wiping out not just his family, but his entire lineage. Every branch of his family tree is killed at a Castle family reunion. His aunts, his uncles, his parents, his cousins, his nieces, and nephews? It's so excessive just how many family members are killed all at once. Like, this is Uchiha clan levels of massacre. Ironically, as cartoonishly over the top as this is, I find it way less disturbing than Punisher's comic origin. Turning the death of Frank Castle's family into a big, epic, multi-man gun battle turned high-impact car chase with brawling and headbutts and shooting and BAM! Just sucks the terror out of it. Now it doesn't feel like this random, awful thing that could have happened to just anyone. It was a more personal mission of revenge against Frank specifically that, like, escalated to the point of being ridiculous. That end, we don't really get to know any of these family members at length before this happens, so they're just scores of NPCs that we only really feel bad about because we know they're somehow related to Frank. You'd think in a movie this long they'd try to flesh out more of these characters, but that runtime's devoted to the middle section of the movie where long stretches of nothing really interesting happens. One of the major reasons I never really loved the 2004 Punisher movie was because I always felt the glacial pacing killed a lot of my hype. It's cool that so many characters from the Marvel Knights book made it here, those being Punisher's quirky trio of neighbors in his apartment building, but I feel like too much emphasis was placed on them in an attempt to humanize the stone-hearted murder fella. But at least, that wasn't in vain. If there's anything this movie can claim to have over the other two, it's that they did a really decent job of making the Punisher of all people seem like a likable guy that isn't completely fucking terrifying. Thomas Jane portrays the Punisher with a more understated sadness than an unbridled rage. He's like a broken man that has nothing left and no reason to smile, and you do feel for him. It's nice having the neighbors reach out to him, and he's like not really receptive to the pleasantries, but he's polite enough to go along with it. If there's any version of the character that had the tiniest shred of, like, heroism and honor, it's this one. That being said, he's still solid when he's doing his Punisher thing. It's just a small segment of the movie by comparison. I hey, he's even got the vest from Punisher Year One! Rather than Frank in his full outfit chasing down criminals and putting a boot down the collective throat of organized crime, a lot of this movie veers off into the somewhat ridiculous territory of him psychologically terrorizing Howard Saint by gaslighting him with, like, elaborate pranks? He stole Howard Saint's wife's car and parked it in front of a hotel and put down a fake fire hydrant and called the parking commission to get parking tickets on her car and then returned her car and then planted her earrings on Howard Saint's gay best friend's bed so Howard Saint would assume that his wife was having an affair with his friend who he didn't know was gay but also Frank took pictures of the friend posing as an anonymous blackmailer to also orchestrate the areas that he would go to further implicate him with the wife. Also there's a deleted scene where I'm pretty sure Frank makes a veiled homophobic remark and uh... I'm gonna go smoke some cigarettes. You don't smoke. Uh, this really is based on Garth Ennis comics. This is a lot of shit, and at a certain point I feel like it would make more sense to just blow them all up with an RPG or something. But the point was to make Howard Saint feel like his life was blowing up and trick him into killing the people he loved most. I get what they were going for, and Punisher is one for some really over-elaborate plans to get the bad guy. 
But after a while, this just feels like overkill, and it was a lot less fun to watch than him rolling through a guy's house with a bulldozer or something more blunt and stupid. The actual action scenes are really cool when they finally do get around to them. The battle with the Russian has to be like top five comic book movie fights, though. It's just so much fun. Frank Castle's got a cool souped up muscle car with extra armor. He's got all kinds of traps and secret weapons in his apartment. And he's pretty handy with a shotgun when the time comes. There's just so much slow, introspective downtime between. But like, for characters that aren't Frank, which is weird. Do we need this scene where a random hitman comes into the diner and intimidatingly plays guitar at the Punisher in a slow, moody scene like it was a western? In fact, a lot of this movie's vibes are like a western, with these slow, tense standoffs between him and the bad guys, and just the general sound of the score. <laughs> that guy that blew up off-screen becomes Jigsaw in the PS2 game and steals an Iron Man suit from Stark Industries. Though, I will commend this movie for not just trying to be mindless violence. It was going for something, and uh, its successfulness is kind of, like, you know, up to your personal interpretation. The opposite end of the spectrum where it's just shooting and blood without any substance would be just as irritating. Surely the next movie would find a happy medium, right? You know what, before we get to that, let's give an honorary mention to Thomas Jane's second live-action outing, which of course he did because he's actually a really huge fan of the character. Okay, yes, technically this one is an unlicensed fan film, but it was produced by a lot of official people working in Hollywood, and the cast includes, yes, Thomas Jane, and also, <gasps> it's Ron Perlman! It was one of several unofficial high-budget, high-production-value fan projects under the Bootleg Universe label produced by Adi Shankar, who you might know from his work on Dread, one of the kick-assest movies ever made. And for an unofficial project, it's pretty solid. The short centers on Frank, wandering into a bad neighborhood where everyone lives in fear of the local gang. However, I don't exactly vibe with the choice to have him be all reluctant to help any of these people until the very last minute. He ignores in-progress crimes to just get his laundry done, keep his head down, and get a drink. He's got his own great power, great responsibility mantra, albeit more drastic and twisted. If you have the power to shotgun someone, you should. The idea of him just neglecting to help everyone out there getting brutalized feels off and conflicts with my other rule for writing Good Punisher. I think a crutch some writers use to adapt him is having him feel conflicted about his role as a vigilante and have him trying and failing to quit being a killer. This is a pretty standard generic character conflict that we've seen a million times with a million movie tough guys. Every time I try to get out they just keep pulling me back in and so on and so forth. He just needed his depressed, I'm done with that life beard. But one of the things I always liked about the character in the comics was his singular focus and extreme dedication to his cause. He's like the opposite end of Batman, who is equally as upright in his principles about never killing. Both of these guys are interesting when they're super determined to do things their way, whatever the cost. But for some reason, we keep getting movies where Batman is constantly killing people and Punisher movies where he's so reluctant to kill. What the hell happened? Can these characters, like, act like themselves and not like each other, please? Even in spite of this, Thomas Jane gives a strong performance again, and the short is pretty stylish. I just find myself distracted by the lack of original score, because, speaking of Batman, all of this is music from the Dark Knight soundtrack. Also, that bottle of Jack Daniels is made of adamantium, my god. It's not a perfect send-off to Jane's take on Punisher, but it's still nice to see him again after it seemed pretty certain he was a one-and-done deal. I like that Skull logo better than his other one. The Skull is still on his vest, but it's barely visible. It looks fine on the poster, but in the movie it's like 5% opacity. What, were they embarrassed again? Did they think it looked too silly? COWARDICE! Also, like... Why would you get self-conscious about that sort of thing in this movie? Oh, for fuck's sake. It's like everyone wants to adapt different parts of the Garth Ennis books, usually just the quirky side characters and foul-mouthed villains and the dark comedy tone, except they neglect the most interesting part, the characterization of Frank Castle. 
The book is a really deep dive into the mind and psychology of Frank Castle, and he's the central component of the emotional core of that story. Like, it's a big character study, really. We understand his trauma, his rage, his history in the war, his childhood, his personal ideology, his thought process behind his strategies, his philosophy on his own existence, his insecurities about the life he's chosen for himself, and his longing for a better one where he feels more whole as a person. Ennis's Frank Castle is a truly deep and fascinating character. You know, fascinating in the same way as like Hannibal Lecter or Darth Vader, where you know he's crazy and clearly bad, but you understand how he got there, and he's so charismatic and badass that he's fun to watch. He's just such a well-fleshed-out character in these books, and yet the three different times these comics have been adapted, they didn't really go for any of that. Thomas Jane isn't written to be nearly as obsessed and twisted. Ray Stevenson is barely a character at all, and the movie forgets he exists half the time. And with John Bernthal's Punisher, they opted to write him more like an eternally conflicted fusion of Jason Bourne and Wolverine, so he'd be more relatable. Repeating the same character arc three times is more relatable. I often feel like recent movie discourse confuses character depth with how often does he quip or how relatable is he. Punisher doesn't need to be a down-to-earth relatable guy to be interesting, but he also doesn't need to be like a stoic, emotionless zombie that's treated more like an entity than a real character. I'm going to be saying all of this again in a few years when they finally make that Spawn movie that barely has Spawn in it. All that being said, I don't love this movie's take on Frank that much. We skim over the origin this time, and now Frank's been at large for a few years doing his thing, until one night he accidentally PUNISHES an undercover cop and creates a nemesis in Jigsaw. Uh, who, like, by decades predates the villain played by Tobin Bell. A criminal that Frank horrifically deforms but accidentally leaves alive. So Jigsaw is putting together a huge revenge plot and Frank's just sort of moping around about hitting an unintended target. So he's heavily considering hanging up the vest. But he just loves punishing too damn much. <laughs> Plus the family of the dead undercover cop is now in Jigsaw's sights for revenge. So Frank has to take on the uncomfortable job of being a protector instead of just mashed potatoing people. Jigsaw is the big standout of this one. He's the best villain these movies have had yet. He's just so cartoonishly evil and vile, and the practical makeup for his facial scars looks really good. He's so chilling and his face gives you a slasher villain vibes like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Fuck you. This version of Frank is underdeveloped, and his two sidekicks, Micro and Carlos, barely get any screen time either. I think you could have devoted a lot more time to them in particular. The story of how Micro became Frank's armorer could have been fun to adapt, and the idea of Carlos, a former criminal, teaming up with the Punisher in itself is a great concept, because it challenges his idea that a lot of these gang members can't be reformed. This guy could have been such a huge factor in this movie, but instead, that stuff is pushed to the wayside for Jigsaw and his brother just being loony together. If there's something I can certainly praise about this one, it's that this movie finally wades into the murky waters of Punisher's opinion on police and systemic corruption. It's faint, but it's there. Something that often gets ignored about the character is that he's critical of the police, thinking they're serving a corrupt justice system or they themselves are too corrupt to get anything done. Punisher wouldn't be the Punisher if he thought the police were doing their jobs properly. In the comics, he also scoffs at the idea of them idolizing him because it's fundamentally hypocritical and dangerous for them to think that way. That's another one of those Punisher adaptation rules I have, and it's weird that only this one took the time to address that considering how much everything else in this movie is a big cartoon. Although they fumble the landing a little bit, this movie kind of loses the plot on murderous vigilantes being a bad thing and basically absolves Frank of all guilt at the end by going, Nah, you're good, no one's mad at you. And all the police characters in the movie are like reluctantly helping him out constantly, which the movie doesn't acknowledge as being extremely bad. It's more just played with like an irony and a smirk like, oh man, it's crazy that they're helping the Punisher. They should be not doing that. Throwing you a tip now and again is one thing. Password to the crime database, etc. But letting you go? So, fine. You know, so they lose points for all that shit. Maybe Punisher himself isn't as much of a focus as I'd have liked him to be, but the tone is 
closer in this to what I would want. It's got crazy bad guys, it's dark, but also silly and, like, allows itself to have fun. And the only part of the movie taken deadly serious is the Punisher himself. He shouldn't be quipping or being an incompetent fool, but the stuff around him is allowed to be funny. Plus, the fight scenes afford themselves some excessiveness that's fitting for the character. Sometimes it goes overboard and it's just really dumb, but their head was in the right place. I just wish it was all in service of a stronger story and better characters. Warzone seems to be a confused movie that isn't entirely sure what it wants to say about Frank, so his inclusion is muddled and it comes across like a more generic action movie with the by the book cop and the loose cannon who plays by his own rules. With the benefit of existing in a world such as the MCU, future Punisher movies can drop the effort to be so grounded with their stories and villains. I like to think one of these could feel more like Smoke and Aces or Bullet Train, where there's like a whole cast of weird and eccentric bad guys with their own gimmicks and personas all coming out of the woodwork to kill the Punisher. I want to see Punisher versus guys like Bullseye, Bushwhacker, Barracuda, someone else with a B name, or even some weirder ones like the Jackal. Fuck, let's have Punisher hang out with Spider-Man. That's never been done before, and I guess Tom Holland and John Bernthal are buddies. Some of the most fun Punisher storylines are stuff like him trying to assassinate Norman Osborn and being hunted by the Sentry, or him stealing an old war machine suit to go try and create peace in the Middle East, or when he was on a team with Deadpool, Ghost Rider, and Venom. Him and Venom have a lot in common, actually. Two Spider-Man villains with complex morals that got popular enough to just become solo characters and turn into anti-heroes. All three of these movies checked a few marks for me, but none of them quite got the whole list. And neither did the TV series. I guess the only Punisher adaptation to do all of the stuff I wanted was the video game. And that game kicks ass. Go watch my video on it. I know it's really picky to have such excessive criteria for this character, and even the source material sometimes fails to hit those marks. But I think if you find the winning combination of those ingredients, it makes for an incredibly compelling character that has some of my favorite comic stories. It's just that he's harder than most to get totally right. It's like how Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man have had their own fair share of bad adaptations, but when you get it right, it's a really satisfying end result. I have a sense that Hollywood wants to make this character work, but have this air of discomfort around the more unpleasant reality that can stigmatize the character. So they ground it too far into the real world to try to unpack all of this and it stops being as fun as it could be. Or they go too silly with it and it becomes tone deaf. Okay, <sighs> the politics of it are an inevitability. He's an angry white man with a gun taking the law into his own hands. He's a traumatized veteran who was forgotten by his country. He's in pursuit of a mission fueled by a law system completely broken down by corruption. These are things you have to address, but you can also have a little fun with it too because it's a comic book! It can handle these messy real-world issues that are inherently built into the story while also being an adventurous comic book story. These are not mutually exclusive. Batman has been pulling that off for decades. His newest movie addresses incel conspiracy nuts planning acts of domestic terrorism and has scenes of him solving funny riddles on a card and wearing bulletproof super armor and making out with his girlfriend that likes to dress up as a cat. I think The Punisher deserves the same kind of efforts from a movie or a TV show adaptation. But a show about comic accurate Punisher would get boring and repetitive. He's just killing criminals over and over. Yes, and you can make a fun series about a crazy sad guy going on a revenge rampage against hundreds of armed criminals. We're on John Wick 4. Yes, you can make a show about a serial killer vigilante that's disconnected from his humanity. We're on season 11 of Dexter. If you're one of those guys that commented that on my review of the Netflix series, I'm sorry, but you have a profound lack of imagination and should slap yourself for being so reductive to make such a bad point. You can make any premise sound bad if you phrase it like that. So it's just some guy with a bat costume catching lunatics at every movie? It's just a war in space that keeps going? How can the guy finding old magic treasure not get repetitive after one movie? Slap yourself harder, you're stupid! Anyway, Dexter as John Wick with bullet train villains is my elevator pitch to get this series back on the right track. But who knows, maybe they'll just adapt Frankencastle and call it a day. As for what's the best Punisher movie? 
Uh, it was a PS2 game. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, Finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years! Not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So, maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If everyone who watched this video donated one dollar a month, I'd be able to afford a house for myself, so that would be, that would be really cool. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator code XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time!